Now we go to the stars. That's right. Indeed. In, in, in. Well, it is wonderful <laughs> seeing you all. I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware. So okay, I know Wilmington. I know yes, yes, indeed. And of course, our president knows which Yes, yes, yes. 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 And he Wilmington. has been made yes. it clear that he's <laughs> So uh, following on, on Christina's lead, lead here a bit, I thought um, I would tell you just a little bit about myself. This is actually a famous podcast in the Midwest, Que Pasa in the Midwest, where is the Midwest? And to some extent I was, thought I'd start here because I wasn't sure who would be in the room, but even those from the United States, from the coasts, are not always sure where the Midwest is. <laughs> so, um, so uh, this is the Upper Midwest. I am from uh, Madison, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin. And as the taxi was arriving to pick me up, I was very, very, very quickly shoveling. My wife just had her uh, hip replaced. All went fine. And I just had a sense that if my marriage was to continue, I better get the sidewalks cleared. But I also bring this up because, um, by good fortune, uh, my landlord in Concepcion has turned out to be a friend, and even we haven't even met yet. He's an architect, and he asked me once while we were talking. He said, "Well, it's like that." I was describing snow. He said, "How do you live?" <laughs> and, and, and and so I thought I would show him this, and then show you as well. I mean, you have to you have to start early. Um, that's <laughs> very very important with your children and your grandchildren. Uh, this is my son pulling her on the ice that he used to skate on and sled on when, when, he was, when he was young. And we go skiing with them on our backs, and, and uh, I, I, I think this face uh, says it all. But the key is to start early, and otherwise, uh, who knows what may happen. The irony is that my son actually did not like skiing as a child. We used to take him out and doing the same thing, so you never know what's going on. So, to the stars. Yes. <laughs> uh, when we were out for dinner the other night, Hannah, uh, one of the Fulbright students, and I were teasing each other about the connections, or perhaps lack thereof at the time, between humanities and, and STEM. We were teasing each other as she was trying to figure out the bill. And um, <laughs> I, I, so I want to take a, a moment just to pause here before we even talk about any science to just enjoy. Uh, there, it, 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 as so many pictures of insects and so many things, is just spectacular. And whenever I start to teach my classes, we just start out with pictures. No science, no math, just the glory of the universe. And I thought I would start in that same place. Now, this, that, this is a star cluster. It's known as a globular star cluster. This is another one which those of you in the north see it with your naked eye, it's called the Pleiades. And if you look carefully at this, of course, there's something strikingly different, which is that there are all these very bright stars, these blue, hot, very luminous stars. And the thing that's important about that is we know that these stars have masses about 10 times the mass of the sun, but they're shining at about a, roughly 100 million times faster than the sun. So third graders can put those two things together and say, these aren't going to last very long. Okay? These blue stars are going to disappear quickly. And as we progress to older and older cluster stars that are more massive will slowly disappear into neutron stars and white dwarfs. This is only 100 million years old. This is very young. And that is the essence of stellar evolution. I don't need to teach you anything more. <laughs> the rest is details. Uh, and this was known more or less in the 1950s. And of course, again, just showing you here, this is dramatically different. There aren't those bright blue stars. Lots of red giants, lots of beautiful red giants. And, but, but you've probably noticed that there are stars here Someone else used this phrase earlier today. Stars that shouldn't be there. There's that blue star right there, which I just told you should be gone. And in fact, if you look carefully, there are blue stars scattered all throughout here. 
And they were known in the 1950s, and they were called blue stragglers because they were straggling behind. Their evolution was going more slowly. And for well nigh 50 to 60 years, they were just thought to be anomalies, exotica, um, butterflies, if you will. And as is always the case, whether it be the procession of Mercury or these stars, it always turns out that they have a story to tell that's far more important than anybody thought. And that's really what we've been working on for the last 10 years or so. It turns out that if you do careful senses, uh, a free quarter of all stars don't do what I told you stars do. That simple story. And it's because roughly half of the stars in this cluster are, each are actually two stars going around each other. And as my students know, in fact, everyone in the department of Madison, Wisconsin, knows that when they take the prelim, the answer to any question Bob asks is, yes, the answer is in the binary stars. <laughs> and that is true, is true here as well as it turns out. So these stars aren't really straggling. What nature has found a way to do is to take a normal star and put more mass back on it and make it a bigger star, essentially refresh it rebirth it, if you will. And I'm not going to go into any of the math. I'm just going to show you some ways that that might happen. Let me show you some movies. One thing that can happen is as the star becomes a red giant, it fills the space of its own gravity. It tries to go out beyond that. And the material falls onto the other star. It gets pulled into the other star. And when this is all done, this star is more massive than it was, and this one actually is a white dwarf left behind. And so this star becomes bluer in this process called mass transfer. Or perhaps two stars literally run into each other. You know, when I'm on a plane, people ask me what I do. You can determine whether you want to talk to the person or not by what you say you do. If you say that you do astrophysics, that will shut things down. <laughs> on, on the other hand, if you say I work on colliding stars, well, then you'll have a conversation. Yeah. And, and so we're, we're going to talk about colliding stars here. This is, these are two stars that are going to, you'll soon see, go just or orbiting around each other. This happens to be a triple. This star is going to go around. Picture it traveling through that cluster, and you're going to see another pair of binary, another binary come in, and they're going to go through this beautiful, chaotic gravitational dance. Oops. That ultimately, well, you will see what happens. So there they are, they're just traveling along. That's a happy triple. Oh, there came that binary, and I'll show it to you again. They go through this dance, and then collision. Now we have a more massive star, more blue. They're going to continue this dance. One of them is actually going to get kicked out. And what's left behind is a blue strangler. Right, again, a refreshed star. Just for fun, I'll show it to you again, because that was fast. Hey, Bob, how long does that take to happen? Yeah. Which part? From the start of this video to the end. I mean, not the video itself, but I mean the real star. <laughs> The, the interaction probably takes on the order of thousands of years. Wow, it's nothing. Very fast. Yeah. Right. Very, very fast. And of course, the third graders love this. So it's not like, because I was thinking immediately, oh, this is great. You can study then. No, it's not possible. All you can do is study the product, what went in, what went out, okay. and see what might have happened. Okay. And since you asked, yeah. Alan, the, uh, the last possibility is that two stars in a binary, for reasons that we can go into, it need not, their orbit may decay and they may simply merge with each other. And this <coughs> simulation takes about five days. Each orbit is about a day. These two stars are going around each other in a day. Right? I mean, as we sit here, the stars are going around each other. And we've seen many like that. but. If the orbit actually decays, then this is a very expensive calculation, by the way. Um, um, but you'll see, and interesting things happen. And then in the end, it's also just beautiful as an aside. Yeah. It's like cotton candy. Indeed. And they're going 
going to merge. In the process, they're also going to throw out some mass. And when it's all said and done, there's one star that has not quite twice, but maybe one and a half times mass before a blue star. So all of these processes can happen. And the fundamental mantra for me, at least, is if it can happen, it will happen. And I won't go into this in, in detail, but um, there are multiple channels. And we don't produce the correct number of blue stragglers when we go through these channels. So what am I doing? I'm going to the universe, for the first part, I'm going to the Universidad de Concepcion also, UDEC. And with Nathan Lee, who also is working with Robert, some of you have met one of the students, uh, we're going to develop, we, I'm going to tell him what nature does, and he's going to develop theoretical models uh, to study those techniques that I was talking about. I'm also writing a, a review paper, and then most importantly, I want to learn new astrophysics and with, with the students. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. So this is the astronomy side of, of what I'll be doing. And to be completely honest, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Whether it will be profound, we shall see. I'm not, it's not in the sense that we're going to be doing what in the sense we, we could be doing by Zoom except for this part. And that's, that's what I think is the important part. Now, the other part of my life and what I've been doing, and it's interesting you mentioned this, is teacher preparation. We're going to be doing teacher preparation. We've been doing teacher preparation for the last 20 years. But keep teacher preparation for faculty, for higher education. I don't know about the rest of you, but I was not prepared for my job. No one taught me how to teach. I left Berkeley a fine researcher, and then I had to teach. And um, I won't even discuss whether I did it well or not. What I know is I didn't do it in an informed way. And I asked why to myself. And 20 years ago, Alan and I were talking, after you become a full professor, about 40, and you sit there and you say, OK, now what am I going to do? I've spent my whole time going through all the hoops to get to where I am. Now I have 20 years left. What am I going to do? And for me, the answer was, I love astronomy, and I've been doing it for the last 20 years. But I also wanted to do something that was more significant for this world right now. And uh, improving undergraduate education is what I decided to really uh, do. And when I sat back and said, well, how am I going to do that? It, it turns out we know how to improve learning. And you describe some ways. Active learning, engaged learning, is how it works. There's the National Science Foundation has invested 30 years of money into figuring out how to ensure STEM education works better. And the biggest problem is the faculty don't use it. Faculty still lecture. Faculty still do things classically as they always have. Despite all of the research that we cherish as our fundamental being that says, Students don't learn well that way. Or more precisely, the students who learn well that way become us. And all of the other students that don't learn that way leave STEM. And we lose the diversity of their, their creativity. And we do a tremendous disservice to the entire nation and indeed the entire world. So the idea I came up with at the time with many colleagues, I mean, I'm just saying I because I'm so was why don't we prepare graduate students? Why don't we prepare the teacher preparation, the future faculty, in all that is known while they're in graduate school? And so we created a, a center, and this is a mouthful, right? To develop national STEM faculties committed to implementing and advancing, this is crucial, effective teaching practices for diverse student audiences as part of their professional careers. All right, that's a mouthful. What are we really doing? Preparing graduate students and postdocs for careers that integrate the forefront research that we already know how to teach in the graduate school with superb teaching and learning. We're doing teacher preparation. We're doing uh, no say. Um, and the strategic idea, and this is what I'm not sure about whether it will be true in Chile. In the United States, 80% of the PhDs are produced in about 100 research universities. 
Now that may seem like a lot, but there's 4,000 institutions of higher education. If you can get to them here, not only are they young, not only are they blank slates, not blank because after all they've never been students for 20 years, but are they, they don't have yellow notes yet, let's put it that way. If you can get to them here, then they fill the entire system with new teachers who do know how to teach. That's the essential strategic idea. 80% of PhDs at only 100 research universities, that's a 40 to 1 leverage. That was the essential idea 20 years ago. Um, and the question is, especially for those of us that are in research universities, out of all of this landscape, this is probably the one place where teaching is not necessarily a top priority. So how do you change the culture? And we had three principles that we ran with. And by the way, this is all going to sound like it was just obvious and worked. I can't tell you how many things didn't work. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but this idea of teaching is research, this idea that teaching well is as dynamic and as advancing an activity as your research is. It's not something where you're just trained how to do it and that's it. It's not a, it's, it's not a training process. It's learning how to apply your way of thinking in your research, your discipline of research, to your classroom. Something we call teaching as research. This has a huge cultural advantage. So when I go into the, say, mechanical engineering department, if I talk to them about good teaching, if I talk to them about scholarship and teaching and learning, if I talk to them, please over. If I talk to them about research and how you can use your skills to improve your teaching. If I challenge them, it's a whole different perspective that aligns with research universities, with the culture of the university. Just to give an example of how that plays, this happens to be, Matt is in material science, this is about five years ago. Matt created, he did a teaching as research project, we call it. Uh, he created fuel cells, he analyzed them using, you know, his, skills in material science. I love this line he wrote, although the assessment of the first implementation proved to be somewhat inconclusive, <laughs> research, right? It didn't work, is what he's saying. And, you know, we are so arrogant, especially as scientists, I love what you said, as scientists, that we figure teaching is easy, yeah. right? Anybody can do this. No, actually it's really hard to teach well and to have learning happen. And so then he redid it, and by chance he published. We're not really worried about whether they publish. We want them to become faculty who use this way of thinking in their classrooms. The second principle is learning community, which I don't need to necessarily talk to people here about. But you know, most of us, maybe not the mathematicians, we'll see, <laughs> most of us work in research groups. We work in communities. We teach alone. You walk into your department, teach this course. I will, I'll see you at the end. Why do we do that? And how do we avoid that? And that's what learning community is about. And just to show you what a program looks like, this is partly for you, Alan, because Idaho just joined. Um, this is essentially what you might even consider to be a relatively standard curriculum. But, you know, Lisa is now a professor at St. Lawrence. Um, you know, just look at the arrows. I, I want you to see the vitality of the connections between Lisa and, um, ah, I forgot her name. She's now an associate professor at University of Illinois. And Trina, who actually is now the director of this program, um, I just want you to see the, the vitality and the excitement of connecting about teaching. The other thing which we did not know but turned out to be incredibly powerful, is we decided to be interdisciplinary because we were worried if we did it in departments, we wouldn't have enough people, wouldn't have a critical mass. So we decided to make it entirely interdisciplinary. You know what the first thing the grad students say in every evaluation? The best part of this was meeting students in other fields. I mean, we, that wasn't planned. That came straight out of the evaluations. So let me just go on because I'm taking too much time. 
But I do want to emphasize this third idea, which is called learning through diversity. And I think this is going to be, I want, I want to see how this plays in Chile. Um, of course, inclusive teaching is the first step, but that's not what learning through diversity is about. Let me read this again. Engaging the diverse experiences of all in the learning of all. And if I could make the distinction here a little bit, imagine, I try not to lecture, but imagine I go in and give a lecture and I use inclusive teaching techniques and every student feels welcome there. That's inclusive. But if those students haven't talked to each other, then I haven't used the value of the diversity of those students and all that they know that I don't know for them to learn from each other. That's what learning through diversity is about. And so the idea is engaging, which of course is exactly what you were doing. This is not profound, right? Engaging the diverse experiences of all and learning of all, which leads to a self-sustained culture where excellence and diversity are necessarily intertwined. Once you realize this is true, once these young future faculty realize this, they're never going to be able to lecture again because they'll realize what isn't happening in their classrooms. And I say all this because we've done longitudinal studies up the last two years. It's been 20 years. OK, so let me skip this. I'm taking too much time. We started at Wisconsin and Penn State, near Scranton, not quite. Um, now uh, we are a network across Canada and the, and the United States of 42 universities, each of which has a sort of learning community on their campus, done their own way. And one thing we learned is if you want organizational change, don't tell people how to do it. We give them the three principles, we show them an example, and then they all do it their own way, including I.O. And that's just fine. We've intentionally been very diverse, right? We have private universities, we've got an engineering university, we have uh, an HBCU, we've got MSIs, the University of California. And what we do online, I mean, every school does its own, but we also connect all the future faculty online through a pretty intensive curriculum that they can take part in. Because the one thing a student at Wisconsin knows is that she's not going to be a professor at Wisconsin. But the only thing she will know coming out of grad school is Wisconsin. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that she's also learning the students from Howard, the faculty from Yale, Learning through diversity. This is learning through diversity. So, oh, by the way, this is now 33% of the US production. So what am I going to do? First thing I'm going to do is <coughs> say, listen, I need to learn about Chilean higher education. I've read a lot, but I need to listen. I'm going to, I'm going to travel for, to seven to 10 universities, except in Concepcion, Santiago, La Parisa, because I want to go there, and La, and La Serena. Um, I want to learn. I'm, we're going to share ideas. I'm not just going in there to tell them what we know. We're going to share ideas. Diversity and equity is a huge issue in Chile. Uh, learning is also a huge issue here. Roughly speaking, Chile is about, uh, I'll use the word carefully, 30 years behind us, but I mean like chronologically. They still do things very, very classically. But they're in the process of going through changes we went through about 30 years ago. And I, we just want to talk about that. And I'm, I actually don't know where their faculty come from. You know? So if we're going to prepare future faculty, you have to know the pipeline. I'm teaching a future faculty course in UVEC because I want to learn from the students. So I'd like to be a grad student here. How does this go? Does this make any sense to them? What if two students show up? Remember, there aren't little arts colleges. There aren't two-year colleges. There aren't comprehensive colleges. It's a pretty classical system. So will this make sense to them? And then uh, my hope, of course, is that maybe, just maybe, after all, for the last two years, we've been doing CERTL online. Chile's no problem. And so just to finish up, it, uh, this is not a one-off. My hope is that we develop a deep connection between Chile and at least us at first. But remember, there's a whole network up here in Canada and the US that Chile can connect with. And if this works, then the world is our oyster. We'll see, we'll see how this goes. But that's why I'm here. And I would say one thing that's different about me than some of you is that we really are just starting. 
I love what you said. You have to reread your proposal. <laughs> we haven't been working with this for two years. <laughs> and so uh, we have four months, I think, to launch things. We're not going to do it in four months. What we're going to do is make this happen. At least that's the plan. So, enough.